uh, you thought you said y i think by mistake so the horizontal oh, yeah. is the x so on this x axis we see rank and like yes, you said uh, you know, i mix them um... mm -hmm. yeah that's okay uh rank of uh, settlement so the biggest settlement is rank one the second biggest is rank two the third biggest is rank three and so forth and so on and on the y axis on the on this uh, vertical axis we plot size of settlements and size can be plotted either as total population for example in like hundreds of people or thousands of people or in size if you accept the assumption that the bigger the settlement is the more people live in that settlement you can just plot size so for example one hectare you know 10 hectares 20 hectares um, or if you have some more detailed calculations of actual people numbers if you say 10,000 people 20,000 people 30,000 people that's what's plotted on the y-axis so x and y-axis that's what's plotted <clears throat> and then we just look at these plots and see what's going on in that particular region. So for example, we take a uh, river valley um, somewhere in the Southern Urals and we find, you know, 30 or 50 settlements there that all belong to the Bronze Age period. So we go and record them, we measure their size and we plot the sizes of these settlements on, on such a graph. So before we talk about this uh, anymore, let me actually, uh, clarify the logarithmic scale for you guys. Um, not all of you may know what it means. If, well, let me ask first, do, which one of you can explain, if you know this, what logarithmic scale means? A graph that is drawn in the logarithmic scale. Maybe from your last years of high school math, or I'm not sure in Russia if, you go over this type of stuff in high school or maybe at a, only at a university level. Okay, I don't see any hands up. Okay, Vlad, go ahead. I will try. Uh, as I remember, logarithm show uh, in what uh, no, the storm English tipping, you need to put this number to get and those numbers, remember. So in in the graph, it allows us uh, to avoid some maybe row uh, change of uh, of line and make it uh, visible for us. So in case of line, it's Oh, I can't explain explain to you how it looks, but I hope uh, I was understandable. Yeah, and and it's not easy to explain, but you definitely had some valid points, some good starting points there. And uh, I don't want to confuse you guys, um, so I will not talk about logarithms or anything like that. I will just talk about the logarithmic scale, just what you need to know in regards to these graphs. Because if you don't know this, then it will make it difficult for us to keep talking about this. So give me just one minute and I will try to explain this. I will be drawing this. You don't need to redraw this because what I will do, I will save these drawings and then post them on uh, Canvas. <clears throat> so just, just follow these and make sure you understand what we're talking about. Excuse my handwriting, as you understand, I have to use a mouse, which makes things a bit difficult. Okay, so here I drew a graph in a regular, it's also called arithmetic scale your regular graph that you guys all know and love from you know your previous coursework. So here on the x-axis we have a rank, you all understand what a rank is, and on the y-axis we have size of a settlement. So on, in a regular scale, our values on the x-axis go 
two, three, four, five. But a logarithmic scale, instead of um, adding one item, we multiply the previous item by some magnitude, by some exponent. And uh, depending on what logarithmic graph you're looking at, uh, for example, the graph that you looked at in the Drennan uh, article, in the Drennan and Peterson 2004 article, they used the logarithmic scale of two. A lo a magnet so they multiplied each uh, item or each number in the graph by the scale of two. So in this new logarithmic scale, if I'm using a magnitude of two, but you can use a magnitude of 10, for example, or 20, it's up to you. So when we're talking about the magnitude of two, our first item here will still be two, but our second one will be four, our third one will be eight, and our fourth one will be 16. So you see, I'm multiplying each number by two. Two multiplied by two is four, four multiplied by two is eight, eight multiplied by two is 16, and then this next one would be 32. Right? So that's the difference between logarithmic scale and regular arithmetic scale. And the same thing would be happening along the y-axis. Our first one would remain intact, but our second one would also remain intact because 10 multiplied by 2 is 20. But our third one will become 40 because 20 multiplied by 2 is 40 and our fourth one will be 80. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. So that's the difference between logarithmic scale and regular arithmetic scale. This is what Drennan and Peterson are doing in their graph when they're talking about a logarithmic scale. Let me go ahead and uh, save this just in case. Okay, so let's move on one step further here. And let me talk to you about why would we use a logarithmic scale versus regular arithmetic scale. Give me just one second here. And uh, we use these types of graphs when our data is what's called skewed, skewed data. And let me show you an example. Okay, you guys all know who Bill Gates is, right? Hopefully. Okay, he's the richest man in the world. So if we wanted to plot, let's say our rank size of people's salaries at the company of Microsoft, which Bill Gates owns. So here we would have ranks of people, you know, our highest paid person here then the second highest, third highest, fourth highest, and so forth and so on. And let's say we wanted to plot maybe 50 highest paid employees of Microsoft Corporation. So what we would have, our number one person would be Bill Gates and he would be up here. We would put a dot here and then let's say our two through 50 people would be somewhere between 100,000 and 50,000. So our second person would be right here. Our third person, let's say made like 95,000. Third person would be 90,000 and so forth and so on. So they would gradually decline. And let's say our person, our 50th ranked highest paid person would make 50,000, let's say. So this is an example of a skewed data uh, because this data is skewed to the left. Skewed is the same word for like moved. So you see this distribution is skewed to the left. And so the problem with this type of distribution is uh, it's difficult for me to see any kind of patterns 
among these, uh, you know, two through 50 ranked people, if I try to see, well, what's going on in, in these types of, uh, in this group is difficult for me to see because overall it's just like a more or less flat line here. And if I wanted to get into the intricates of, you know, the, our 40 through 50th ranked between 30th and 30th and 40th ranked people, well, what's going on? I can't really see much because this graph is messed up by this one outlier, one extreme outlier person who's making a billion dollars. And so in this case, for me to evaluate the data better, for me to get a better picture of what's going on, we use a logarithmic scale. Okay, so if I built this graph in a logarithmic scale, it would look much better. And I will show you an example in just a minute. So I'll go ahead and save this. So this is what we're doing here and this is what we're looking at. Okay, let's, uh, let me just stop the screen share. Let's move on to question number four with that in mind. So, Julia, can you read question number four, please? Let me bring it up if you guys don't have it. Uh, so what does the rank size rule suggest? Okay, so what, what is the rank size rule that Drennan and Peterson are talking about? That's right in your reading on the first page. I believe it's on the first page in the right column. If someone can just read that off. <clears throat> yes, uh, I see Julia raised her hand first, go ahead. Uh, so the rank size rule suggests that uh, we might expect the rank two settlement to be half as, as large uh, as the rank one settlement and the rank uh, three settlement uh, to be one third as large as the rank one settlement and so uh, on and so forth. Yeah, exactly. So basically the second largest settlement is half the size of the largest settlement and then our third ranked settlement is one third the size of the largest settlement our fourth ranked settlement is one fourth so basically these settlement sizes whether in population or total area they decrease in this type of proportion when they do that's called a rank size rule okay now let's uh, move on to question five uh, Tatiana, can you read that for us, please? Uh, okay. Uh, what are the major types of rank size distributions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are the major types? Can someone name them for me? Okay, let me uh, <clears throat> draw some examples here for you. So what I'm asking is what are the major types of these rank size plots that we see in analyzing all kinds of settlement systems, whether prehistoric or modern? Yes, Vlad, go ahead. I have unmuted you, Vlad. We haven't heard anything you just said because you were muted. Please start from the beginning. So convex, uh, primate, and uh, long, uh, long normal. Yeah. Okay, so this one that I'll draw here, what is the type of ring size distribution? What is this type called? Uh, long normal. Log normal, right, log normal. This is when rank size rule actually happens. So if 
the rank size rules that we that we just read that the second settlement is half the first and the third settlement is one third of the biggest settlement then our rank size graph will look like this that's called log normal okay what if our distribution looks like that what is this called If this black one was log normal, yes, Vlad. This one called convex. Convex. Mm -hmm. That yes. means uh, vipukle, right? Vipukle. Yeah. So this is a convex type of curve or type of rank size distribution. And uh, finally, let's say we have something like this. What is this one called? The yellow one? Uh, this one called uh, primate. Primate. Okay. Or it's also can be called as concave, vognute, concave, convex, concave, and it's also called primate. And why it's called primate, we'll talk about in just a second. Um, and there is also one more type that Trin and Peterson are talking about. Pick a different color here. Something that's sort of a mix of two, if it looks something like that, like this blue line, what is this one called? Uh, if you look at the actual graphs in Drennan and Peterson, uh, I think it's the last graph. What does it say underneath that graph? Primal yes. context. Primal convex, right? Yeah. yeah, so it's like following the primate distribution for a part of it and then becomes convex in the second part of the graph. Okay, so these are the four basic types. Uh, now let's talk about what they mean. So let's say me and you are archaeologists, we go to the southern Urals, we pick a small step river, we investigate it very thoroughly. We find all kinds of settlements, Bronze Age settlements. We find out their size. Maybe we measure their size in hectares. And we go ahead and plot them in a logarithmic scale in our plot. And we see, um, you know, and we see a black line. What can we say about what went on in the Southern Urals 4,000 years ago if we get this black line? And so to answer that, let's move on to the next reading. Uh, if you guys have your discussion questions there, let's move on to the next Drennan uh, publication. And can someone read the first question from that one? Uh, Jana, do you have access to that? What does a log normal rank size distribution indicate? Yeah. Great, so log normal, like we said, the log normal is this black line. Go ahead and save this drawing. So log normal, what does it mean? Or what do Drennan um, and other, Drennan at all say about this uh, log normal? What does it mean if we see it? What can we say about the settlement system? Uh, yes, so, Julia. Oh. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, Yana, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, so yes, uh, log normal uh, means actually the straight line against which other patterns uh, compared and uh, observed. Okay, and what does it mean? You know, the line itself is just a line, you know, that's great. We got a straight line, great. Mm -hmm. But we are, we analyze human beings. We don't analyze lines, right? We don't study geometry. Uh, we study human beings. What can we say about this kind of a system, this kind of a settlement system in, in human terms? And uh, your Drennan reading gives you the answer. Not the first Drennan reading that we looked at, but the second one. Yes, Julia, go ahead. So uh, they say that 
the long, log normal line represents uh, the pattern sometimes taken to be normal for well integrated centralized settlement system uh, in which the second ranked settlement is half uh, the size of the largest and the third ranked settlement is one third uh, the size of uh, the largest and so on. Mm -hmm. Yes, so the key word here is well integrated well integrated system. So when you think about uh, the distribution of humans uh, together with these humans, you know, if they're distributed uh, proportionally through the landscape, that means that different types of services are also distributed proportionally. Different types of uh, economic resources are also distributed proportionally by economic resources. I mean things like money, wealth, that's also distributed through this river valley quite proportionally. Um, well integrated means, you know, well organized, well unionized, right? Um, these are the synonyms I can think of. So it's basically a well balanced system overall. In terms of human population, you don't want to have big disproportions where, you know, all population is concentrated in one corner of the river valley and then the other parts of river valley are completely uninhabit uninhabited. Um, that's not really good in terms of exploitation of resources, in terms of giving people breathing room and all kinds of other things. So if we're looking, if we find this black line, we know that we're looking at something that is well organized basically. Okay, let's talk about uh, the other type Let's talk about this uh, red line, for example, that we found out is called a convex, a convex type of curve. So what do Drennan uh, and co-authors say about this convex line? What does it mean? And it's right in the reading somewhere. So uh, Julia, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, convex uh, definition actually uh, below the definition of uh, uh, the previous one. So um, convex is usually taken to suggest uh, an only loosely integrated system at best uh, since uh, settlements ranking below one are larger than expected. So it suggests that uh, the presence of uh, several separate systems uh, rather than a single integrated one, uh, since the second, third, and fourth ranked settlements are almost as large as uh, the largest. Yeah, so the key word here is loosely integrated, and I hope I'm spelling this correctly, but um, so basically you can say badly integrated would be a synonym for it. Because remember, on the x-axis, we have ranks. One, two, three, and so forth. And what it means is there are probably competing centers here. You know, let's say we had a, the largest settlement. If we go to number two, there is a settlement that's like really close. And if we go to the third rank, really close. So there are basically three different sort of centers in the valley. And um, that's not normal for a well-integrated system. When we're talking about human settlements, usually the way it works is there is a center which kind of rules over the periphery. If we're looking at about three settlements, three villages, that are about the same size. And then there's all kinds of other small settlements that probably means we're not looking at one well-integrated system. We're probably looking maybe at three different systems. Okay, and this is, comes to the question that Vlad asked about, you know, where do we draw the lines between a system and subsystems? So here we're kind of trying to find out exactly what we're looking at. If we don't know anything about this river valley and we just have this data, <clears throat> we can start building, you know, our explanations, our hypotheses, if we see a line like that, I can say, look, I think what went on in this river valley during the Bronze Age, it was a well-integrated system. 
there was, you know, one central settlement that was well balanced. Uh, it was uh, well organized. If I see a red line, I say, look, I don't think it was actually a one well integrated system. I think it was, uh, if it was a one system, it was badly integrated to where different centers competed for power. Or maybe there were three, or maybe we're looking at three or four or two different subsystems here. And I could say this just by looking at this graph. Okay. If, of course, all of my other assumptions that come with this type of thinking are correct. So let's talk about the yellow line now that we found out is called primate. Or, yeah, primate or concave. What does that mean if we get a primate system? If we see a yellow line or orange line. It's right, the answer is right in the text from which Julia has been reading out of. Yes, Julia, go ahead. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it has um, a central settlement, which is quite uh, consider considerably larger than even the second ranked uh, settlement. Yeah. So it's called primate system. <clears throat> Prime from Latin meanings first or chief. Um, so for example, words like pri primal. Uh, so primate means, and that's why it's called that primate system, meaning there is one huge center that just dominates everything else in that river valley. And this type of system we're definitely looking at one centralized system, but it's not very well balanced for the reasons that I have stated already, right? Because in terms of all kinds of phenomena, in terms of, you know, people's health, in terms of distribution of different services, um, all of the things that come with human population, you want those things to be kind of distributed all over the region more or less evenly and if they're not you're looking at a disbalanced system that will probably experience some problems you're looking at a center that's probably overpopulated and you're looking at other areas of that river valley that are relatively unused where more people could live so this is kind of the example and um, let me go back to the I'll go ahead and save this and post it. Not sure how helpful these graphs will be to you guys, but they will be available in case you want to look at them. Um, so let's uh, go back to the questions. What is the next question that's on that, uh, on that set of questions? Can someone read that off? Um, Okay, actually, can someone read the, the general question at the very bottom? Tatiana, maybe you can. Or, I'm sorry, Vlad had his hand up. Vlad, go ahead. Can you read the general question? Okay, what would Russia's rank size graph look like? Okay. Um, so what do you guys think? I if think, we plotted uh, Russian cities, if we plotted 30 topmost Russian cities like that, what kind of pattern would we get? Would we get a log normal line? Would we get a convex line? Would we get a concave line? I can, I can suggest that. We, two, I have two suggestions. First one okay. that we have a uh, con, convex line, I mean primate, because okay. we know that Moscow is huge and on. But actually, uh, Saint Petersburg is huge too, and we have uh, other big cities. So maybe uh, in the very beginning of the graph, it will be like maybe log normal one, or close to log normal. But in the 
but in the other parts is, it would be like it would look like prime of one. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good observations there. Um, what do the rest of you think? What kind of a graph would we be looking at with Russia? Do all of you agree with, with Vlad here? Even though he put forth two different hypotheses there. Uh, Julia. I would agree uh, with Vlad. Uh, I can provide some other um, aspects. So for instance, um, since we consider the settle settlement, we can uh, provide the example of how the Moscow region, uh, actually the biggest region in the whole Russia. So it means that um, because of the Moscow is the most um, concentrated uh, um, um, economic cent center, since uh, in this in Moscow, um, all the, the oil companies and so on and so on from the uh, whole Russia are uh, center, centralized there. So um, we can trace some connection um, from the fact that it, uh, it's um, the most organized uh, center from, from the perspective of its uh, economics and that it, it uh, connected to the fact that the settlement in this region is the largest. If we uh, if we um, comp compare uh, this region to other regions of Russia. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, it's a uh, uh, primate, um, pr primate, um, um, mm -hmm. primate distribution primate, or primate yeah. rank size graph. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, great points that you're bringing up here, Julia. Thank you. So, uh, this only plots population, remember, but from that we're making some conclusions because like I said, you know, we're assuming that together with population, we can talk about other things because, you know, besides population, what we're really trying to tease out of this is we're talking about the whole system politically, economically, and uh, even if, like Vlad said, first of all, I don't know, I haven't plotted, the actual distribution of Russian cities. Uh, my guess is also like Vlad's is and like Julius that it would be a primate distribution because Moscow is so huge. And depending on if we plot it, you know, if we included all of the suburbs of Moscow too or not, you know, where would we draw the limits? But even if St. Petersburg, let's say, is uh, close, which is, uh, it's actually, you know, I'm looking at on the internet right now, Moscow's population is about 12 million, St. Petersburg is about 5 million. Um, so it would be interesting to see what the plot actually looked like in a logarithmic scale. But even if St. Petersburg is close enough to throw off that graph and make it convex, which I don't think it is because there we need to account for other cities too that are third, fourth, and so on. But even if it is, we know, you know, from living in Russia that uh, it is a primate type of system because all of the resources, all of the control, most of the population is concentrated in Moscow. And this system is kind of disproportionate, you know, if we compare it to other countries in the world, although a lot of countries follow that kind of a uh, system that uh, politic, political and economical system that Russia follows is in that, you know, your capital is the center of everything. That's where all of the money is concentrated. All of the power is concentrated. So it's definitely a primate type of system. Uh, but what I have done is uh, I plotted the uh, top 30 United States cities. I believe this is data from like year 2010 or something like that. So I'm not sure how recent that data is, but at any rate, it's uh, you know, fairly recent data. And so let me show you guys a couple of things that are going on here. I plotted top 30 cities and here you see a list of, you know, the first like 12 or 15 or something like that. You know, you have your population, you have your rank, 
so you understand what goes in this graph. So first of all, if we um, plot non-log transformed arithmetic regular graph, this is what it will look like. Uh, this is kind of what I talked to you guys in the beginning of class. Uh, you know, basically you have this, uh, you know, you have this kind of a flat line and you have your one city that's a, an extreme outlier here in New York, New York City. Um, so it's kind of difficult to interpret what's going on. For example, in this, in this part of the distribution, you know, when we get into our 20s, 25 and so forth. This just looks like a flat line more or less. So once we use our logarithmic scale, and I will post this graph on Canvas, uh, and in, in this case, I use the logarithmic scale of magnitude of two, just like Drennan and Peterson do. So for example, in this x-axis, you see two, four, eight, 16, and on this y-axis, you see um, your, you know, our population doubling. So every, uh, um, you know, every part of the graph, every next little notch, we double our population. And once I log transform this distribution, this is what it looks like. And so this looks like very close to log normal, right? This would be an example of a log normal, just a straight line. And this is what United States looks like. So that pretty much tells us that at least according to this kind of thinking or this kind of logic, uh, United States is a well integrated system. And if we plotted Russia, my guess is it would look, you know, something like this, even after log transformation. That would be my guess. Um, so and that kind of gives you guys sort of food for thought because this is not archaeology. We actually know what's going on in these two countries. We know what's going on in Russia. We know what's going on in the United States. <clears throat> and you can see how accurate this kind of approach is or whether you believe this type of approach or you think it's valid or whether you would <clears throat> use it and trust its results in terms of archeology. span And as far as plotting rushes, uh, I wanted to make it an exercise <clears throat> for you guys to actually get the data and plot it like that. But um, I think it will be, I may do it, you know, next time I teach this class, but for now I won't make you do it because messing with these log graphs could be kind of complicated in Excel. So we have uh, just one more minute left so at this point, we'll part ways. Uh, I don't want to hold you guys up too much. So any questions before we say our goodbyes here? Well, what would a, um, a rank size graph look like for Russia, right? We wondered and we made our guesses. So in the meantime, I've actually constructed uh, a graph and let me just show this to you guys and see what you think. Give me just one second here. Okay, so here I've shown you guys the, the um, graph for the US. And this again, you know, I took 30 largest cities in the US. And next to it, you see 30 largest cities for Russia. And that's based on the recent uh, uh, poll, you know, uh, like when they count the population and stuff like that. So looks like Julia and I think Vlad mentioned this as a possibility uh, that you guys were right in that, you know, Russia's, if we draw a line through it, that Russia's uh, rank size graph looks like a primate type of graph, right? If you guys remember what we talked about the last time. Um, so I just, and you know, US's graph is closer, resembles the log normal, even though it deviates because, you know, these types that we discussed, they're idealized, you know, models. And in real life, things look a little more choppy and dirty, right? You'll never find a perfect log normal or a perfect primate graph 
but you will find something that's closer to one type or the other. And, you know, this is an interesting comparison. So I just wanted to finish that off, but uh, now let's get to Vlad's question uh, that we didn't have time to answer. Vlad, maybe you can repeat your, your idea that you had the last time, if you remember it. Uh, so I remember the question was, why uh, can we, uh, can you be awareness? Uh, oh, what was this? Why do we think that in the in the past, uh, on this uh, spreading of settlement in the prime way or in the convex way should should tell us that connection between is it oh. Uh, well, give, give me a second. I'm sorry. Uh, so, if we if we see the, in the past settlements, uh, and we see that uh, there are the, you know, few different uh, big settlements, why do we sure that there was there was not so much interconnected, or in, in they were not interdependent? Why we can make this conclusion about them? I mean, the, the, why do I wish? Why do I wish sure that some principles of past societies didn't change with time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. It's like a very fundamental question, actually, to archaeological endeavor. You know, to archaeological theory. What you're saying is okay. So let's say we like I said, you know, went to the southern Urals, took a river valley, documented all settlements very well, plotted them on this rank size graph, and we get a certain type, you know, let's say we get a convex or primate or log normal. Why are we so sure that we can actually conclude that this was a well integrated system? Uh, you know, maybe we can conclude it you, like i think that's what you're saying today you know based on like i just took us and russia and we can say okay this is a very centralized system and this one is not but why how can we and why can we project these types of principles to you know four thousand years ago to some river valley in the southern urals right is that kind of what your your question do i understand it correctly uh -huh. Okay, and that's sort of open for discussion. Let's see what kind of opinions you guys have. You know, uh, what do you guys think? You know, do you think that we can or that we can't project these types of principles to the past, to, you know, 4,000 years ago when like a completely different society lived, in, you know, in the Southern Euros, they had a completely different uh, way of uh, getting food than we do now. You know, they did not have the technologies that we have. They were not industrialized. You know, they didn't have tractors and factories and stuff like that. This was a very different type of society, you know, very different type of social structure. Do you think we can or do you think we cannot apply these principles that we use in the rank, in constructing rank size graphs to these past societies and to different types of past societies? You know, uh, they were not even states, for example. You know, they were not, they did not have official governments or they did not have a writing system. Very different from us. But do you think we can still make some conclusions by constructing these rank size graphs. And that's more of an opinion, you know, it's not, there's not a right or wrong answer. I just wanna kind of see what you guys think. Maybe uh, Tatiana, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, I think we can rely on them to some extent because I think this is a general tendency for like, people for human settlements to to gather something important in one place 
and as a result it becoming more extensive but we of course have to take into account the particularities of times and uh, the society constructions and so on okay any so other opinions uh, what what do the rest of you guys think julia any thoughts on this i think we can also assume um i don't know that i think that that's what that's for what all these archaeologists uh, approach exist try to me to measure uh, the data um, as um, as uh, properly as it's possible as closer to maybe some um, objective um, uh, measures I don't know maybe um, um comparative analysis is, can be useful in this uh way when we for instance we observe some um a huge area try to um firstly we we try to observe um in this area some particular elements and then try to um, to analyze uh the the whole data um, and maybe to find some um, similarities between each of uh, components uh, for instance we have uh, um, uh, some um, material culture from uh, two different type of uh, settlement where households were really different by its shape and uh, maybe some uh, objects, but uh, when we can compare them, we can understand um, maybe uh, the um, environment um, environment conditions. Uh, maybe somehow they were different from each other, despite the fact that there is a, uh, the same area. Mm. I think that it's it it it's possible, but um, sometimes it's not uh, it's it's impossible to to um, measure it uh, for sure. For instance, if the current environment doesn't allow you to um, make some experiments and to um, to. Um, check uh, this idea to test some hypothesis mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> and vlad you yourself seem more skeptical about this from what i understand right you are not so sure that we can apply this to any and every culture that we see um i see that we can uh, maybe taste the interconnection between settlements uh we got some archaeological objects so that you can find can excavate like the same culture the same objects maybe the same patterns but uh actually i don't understand uh how uh, a po the point about dependence uh first of all i'm not i don't understand how uh, how can we measure this dependence between different settlements or different regions and the second how can we apply this interdependence to the, this uh, uh, approach mm -hmm. so so that's all okay so uh, one thing that i've heard from uh, <clears throat> vlad and uh, julia is that we need more data <clears throat> besides just the settlement size we need additional type of information and that's true you know no archaeologist would would co make conclusions based on rank size graph only okay we definitely would collect way more information okay we would know <clears throat> what's going on in the region more or less and the state of archaeology now is anywhere you go there was probably a bunch of previous work done 
because archaeology as a discipline has existed, you know, for at least a century. So, you know, if you go to the Southern Urals, if you go to Africa, there is a bunch of archaeology that's already done. And this is more of like a fine tuning approach, you know, finding out more than we already know. So we will collect the ceramics, you know, like I said, for example, we know that these, uh, that these settlements date to the Bronze Age, in my case. We, all, we know that they all date to the same period. We already know this. As far as the <clears throat> interconnection, like establishing interconnection, <clears throat> that's a good point, Vlad. Basically, this approach is based on assumptions, just like any other model that we use, any other theory that we use, you know, is based on the list of assumptions. There is no model that does not have any assumptions built in it. So what this model assumes is that, you know, once you spread people all over landscape, and like I told you guys before, it's not only people that are spread, it's, uh, for example, craft production is spread over the landscape in a certain way. So for example, let's say one out of 10 people on average is a craft producer, you know, someone who specializes in something. So you have a thousand people here, 2000 people there. And I assume if one out of 10 is a crafts person, then we have twice as many crafts people in that settlement than in this one. And uh, let's say, you know, one out of 10 people has musical talent or something like that. So I can say musical talent is also spread all over the landscape. You know, <clears throat> if we have 2000 people and 10% of them are rich, you know, uh, they constitute the elite, the financial elite. I can say the money, like sort of the big money is also spread in this way, because if we look at cities, for example, you know, in Tumen, we have our elite, maybe 10% who have all the money, more most of the money in Moscow, 10% and so forth. So I'm assuming the money is also spread. Then the environmental capacity is also used in a balanced way. You know, for example, people use resources like drinking water, wood, um, grass, for example, if they pasture cattle like they do in the case of um, the culture that I investigate in the Southern Urals. So when people are spread proportionally through the landscape, these activities are also spread proportionally, like the strain that we put on the environment is also spread proportionally. So that's why based on these assumptions, I can say that one system is more balanced than the other. Uh, and uh, as far as the sort of interconnection or interrelatedness, right, or integration, that's sort of Vlad's uh, issue with this. How do we prove this? Well, um, that also stems from an assumption. <clears throat> and, you know, there are usually other lines of evidence. So I'm just telling you guys a part of the picture. Let me give you an example with my um, case that I'm studying. <clears throat> the central settlement where most people are is fortified, right? So there are walls, there are moats dug around the settlement. And the uh, people who are buried next to it they're buried in a fancy way with lavish burial goods. And people who live on the outskirts, on the periphery, they live in unfortified settlements. And it seems like that most of the metal production is concentrated in the central settlement. So from that, you know, we can say that probably the central settlement is where the elite was that ruled over the surrounding territories. But even if we didn't have that evidence, um, you know, basically more people, like I said, means more services, more activities. So at least we can talk about an asymmetry between these settlements. Like if, if there is a huge settlement and a small settlement, in the huge settlement, there are just more opportunities. There's more information. There's more communication. And in the small settlement, you know, let's say a small settlement where only 20 people live, like a, a small village, and here's a town with a thousand people, right away, without knowing anything else, I will tell you that people who live in the, you know, 20 people village, 
they are disadvantaged in terms of what's available to them on a daily basis. For example, you know, if there is a temple, it's in the city. And if they want to go to the temple, they have to go to the city. They have to cross through the fortified walls and stuff like that. So we can talk about that for a long time. But the basic idea is if you agree with the assumptions of this model that with the spread of people, all kinds of other things are spread like resources, craft production, um, information, knowledge, right? Or everything that comes with a person, the person is a container for all those things. Then you can talk about interdependency. Uh, but of course, you know, you need to look at other data as well. You need to look at, you know, in, in my case, warfare, who has the power, who has the means to protect maybe the surrounding villages when they run to the center at the time of war and stuff like that. So hopefully that clarifies, uh, you know, um, this kind of situation for you guys. But also, and, and here's another point that we will get to right now. Um, when you have your model, to prove that it works, you need cases, you need instances, okay? For instance, I'm showing you a case right now. You, if you look on your screen, this case supports this model, okay? Because for example, if we have a huge, you know, if a meteor, meteor hits our planet and our civilization is all covered in ash or something like that, and then aliens or humans from another galaxy come and excavate, and they excavate the United States and they excavate Russia, and they don't know anything yet, but they apply this rank size model and they get these two graphs that you guys see on, on the board. And they will say, look, I think in the case of the United States, we're looking at a better integrated system economically. And in case of Russia, we're looking at a more heavily centralized primate system where probably one town kind of had all the resources concentrated in it would they be right or would they be wrong just based on rank size graph? That's it, that's all they have. I think they would be pretty right. I mean, you look any any objective economic uh, indicators, United States is a better operating, better balanced economic system than Russia is. And Russia is heavily centralized with all, you know, all of the money, all of the resources, all of the power being in Moscow you guys know that. So that's a case to prove that, okay, uh, rank size model or rank size graphs provide good information. But that's a case from the present. Now let's look at cases from the past. So with that in mind, let's move on to our discussion questions that we didn't get to from the last time. Um, and we stopped at the Johnson reading, Johnson 1977, I believe. So if you guys have those discussion questions from the last time, bring them up. I will also bring them up on the board now. And let's start with the first one. Um, okay, so Maria, can you read the first question for us from the Johnson 1977? reading. Uh, yes, I can. Um, what is the rank size pattern for terminal Stusa A? Um, what is going on archaeologically? Okay, so let's try to go through this, uh, you know, one by one. Basically, there are three periods, and I'm asking you what's going on in these three periods in terms of rank size graphs. So, if any of you can answer maybe, you know, the first question or all three, uh, let's, let's start with the first one. All you need to do is bring up the uh, Johnson reading and let me bring that up for you on the board to make it easier. Okay, so the first question is asking about uh, terminal SUSE A period. So can someone tell me what's going on in terminal SUSE A period? You know, what kind of graph are we looking at? Remember, we discussed the basic types, 
there is a convex, there is a primate, there is a log normal. So whenever you guys are ready, Vlad, go ahead. So we see on the convex graph, so we can suggest that in that period, uh, settlements were in the form of uh, few or, or some number of big isolated uh, settlement or a group of settlements. So you said we can conclude what that there are, you said a few settlements? Uh, some number of isolated settlements. Some number of what settlements? Isolated. Oh, isolated. Okay. Isolated, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anyone want to add something to Vlad's comment? Or let me let me rephrase this a little bit. What's going on between the two periods, right? Because, uh, for example, terminal SUSE A, the one I'm asking about, it's this solid line, the lower line. And then we move forward in time, and early Rook period is the next period, and it's this punctuated line. So between the solid line and the punctuated line, what's going on with the graphs and what does it mean and what does Johnson say it means um, in, in the reading? So the answer is in the reading. Uh, Maria, go ahead. In the reading, he says that um, there is uh, the difference. So the first line is about uh, um, shows the, the end of the collapse. Uh, there was a collapse of chiefdom, and the second line shows uh, the formation of uh, state, like the just beginning. But frankly speaking, I don't understand the difference between them. No, I see that one is longer than, than the first one, but um, mm -hmm. why? <laughs> yeah, good. And if you don't understand anything, please tell me, you know, uh, so I encourage you guys to, if you have questions or something is unclear or you don't agree with something, then please tell me. Okay, so first let me ask you guys before I clarify, um, a convex, a convex graph, what does it mean? Just forget about the Sousa and the early Rook. A convex graph, what does it mean? So, it uh, means badly integrated hierarchy. Okay, I think it was Tatiana, right? Yeah. You said like a badly integrated, let's say system, because we are mm -hmm. thinking about systems here and we're talking about a settlement system. Okay, so a convex graph tells you that it's a badly integrated system and why it's badly integrated, let me just repeat that for you guys. You know, here we have a rank and here we have size. So basically when your graph is convex like this, that means that there are a few very large settlements that are about the same in size and they are probably competing with one another. So this is what we have here in the terminal SUSE A period. You see how this graph goes like this. That means there are probably two, maybe three settlements that are about the same size in this, in this valley, in this SUSE valley or the SUSE region. So whenever we see, you know, it's rare if you go like to any nations to see three towns of the same size or three cities of the same size. You know, something is going on. Uh, in modern nation states, you probably won't find any examples. I don't know of any. But, you know, in the United States, you have New York. In, you know, Russia, you have Moscow. So the center is sort of the place where everyone wants to be. Right, everyone wants to be at the center because that's where the money is, that's where the services is, the theaters, the temples, like this is where everything is going on. 
So what Johnson is saying is in this terminal Sousa A period, there are competing, he calls them chiefdoms, and we'll, I'll clarify this for you guys, but I think just intuitively, you know, chief, you all know this word, vorst, right? Chief is vorst, chiefdom is vorstistva. And just intuitively, you understand that vorstistva is a more uh, sort of, I don't want to say primitive, but an earlier uh, type of socio-political structure. And then you have a state, right? Gasudarstva. So vorstistva, gasudarstva. So chiefdom, state. Okay. So in our terminal Susa A, we have a very convex graph, right? That means it's not a well-balanced system and there are probably competing chiefdoms. Chiefdom one, chiefdom two, chiefdom three, and he's talking about four, four autonomous, meaning independent chiefdoms. So do you see any difference in graphs between this graph and this graph? <clears throat> so what is that difference? What's going on? What's going on just with the graph here? Is there any changes at all or do they look exactly the same? Yes, Vlad. Uh, we can say that some big settlement uh, emerged in the graph B. And, okay. and we can say that uh, the difference between between the, the the first few biggest settlements uh, become less, and the, the difference between uh, so that's all actually. Yeah, and that's correct. And overall, I would say this punctuated line is getting a little closer to the log normal overall, right? Like if you look at this gap here, so this is a log normal. This is hypothetically what this, given these population numbers in terminal SUSE A, this is what this line would look like if we had a perfect rank size rule, uh, perfect log normal distribution. We would look at this type of graph and the same for this you know, these log normal are these perfect case scenarios. So in our late early Rook period, the punctuated graph is closer to the log normal than in the previous period. Like if you look at the gap, you know, here, if you look at the gap here versus these gaps is getting mm -hmm. more closer. So the system is getting more integrated and we don't see <clears throat> the convexity vipuklist right? The convexity of the graph decreases. So that means that, you know, these competing centers are disappearing. Probably, you know, one center is becoming larger and the other ones are declining in size or one is becoming larger while the other ones remain the same. So this is what's going on. And uh, when we get to the middle Uruk, this is this, not the punctuated line, forget this punctuated line, but look at this solid line when we get to the middle loop what's going on in terms of a rank size graph and what does it mean maybe someone uh, besides vlad can uh, answer this uh yes maria so here we can see that um uh, there is but according to the text, as text explains, we see that uh, the power of, oh, not the power, how to say right, uh, this is state level controls uh, extends. And that's why this line is uh, longer and doesn't go down, as I understand. Okay. Um... I wouldn't say that the line is longer, but uh, so can someone like rephrase, you know, what's going on with this line compared to the previous periods in the middle of the Julia. Uh, so 
this line uh, this line uh, became more um, uh, opposite to convex she became more strict to the log normal uh, um, line so uh, yeah yeah, I mean, it became very close to log normal, right? I mean, some, some parts of the line are on this side, on the right side, some are on the left side, but overall it kind of wiggles around the log normal pattern. And like I said, you know, log normal, you will never probably see it an actual straight log normal line. I mean, in case there's like a nation of robots or something like that. Uh, you know, but you will see approximations, something that's close, closer to this type, closer to that type, like we see with the United States and Russia, you know, they are not perfect examples, but they're telling examples, you know, these are examples that tell us something, and this example tells us a lot, I mean, this is, you know, very close to log normal in the middle of the rook, and we know, not from this rank size graph, Okay, and that's important to know. We know this, we knew this before Johnson constructed these rank size graphs, that middle of rook is known as the very earliest time period when we see a state in human history, or at least one of the first. Uh, civilizations, as you know, it emerges in uh, between Tigris and Euphrates, right, in Mesopotamia, and it's called the Sumerian civilization. So this emerges right on this territory. So middle of Rook is the period when we see the first what's called city-states. <clears throat> so going back to, and you know, of course this means that we, we see a well-integrated system where people's distribution is distributed quite balanced, quite evenly across this territory. Okay. And with that distribution of humans, like I said before, all kinds of other things are distributed also, you know, priests, musician, talent, uh, the use of nature, the use of resources, money, finances, and so forth and so on. So going back all the way to Vlad's first question, you know, how do we know uh, that this rank size rule is a good rule that we can apply to just about any, um, you know, just about any settlement system that we find. But like I said, to prove that you have a good model, you need cases. You say, okay, look, I looked at like 30 different cases that I knew some information about. And in all 30 cases, this rank size rule gives us an accurate picture. And this is, Th these are the cases, you know, I've shown you already two cases of Russia in the United States. Now you see one more case of uh, Mesopotamia. And like I said, um, Johnson did not discover the fact that in middle Uruk we had a state emerge. We knew this already. We knew this before Johnson drew this graph. And we knew this from other lines of evidence uh, for example, you know, we found administrative buildings, we found seals or stamps uh, that were used as a sign of uh, central power. Um, writings began emerging right around this period, which, you know, writing is a necessary attribute of a state. Uh, cities emerge, we see urbanization. We also see labor, you know, that's state controlled. For example, we find these ration, these little plates that they use to give people rations uh, for participating in large construction projects. And, you know, it was a ration of grain that a worker ate throughout the day. And we find hundreds and thousands of those little bowls spread all through the territory. So that means they were centrally controlled, state controlled construction projects going on. So we know all this and this graph just confirms it. So that's a case for this type of rank size approach. And we've just discussed a few cases. Um, but let me, you know, I would just wanna hear more about this from you guys. What, what do you think in general about applying our modern principles, let's say if we're dealing with economics or something else to the past, 
do you think it's safe to do or not safe to do? You know, for example, we say, well, in our society, we do A, B, and C, and in our society, this model works. If we go all the way back to, you know, 3000 BC, 2000 BC, in different regions, you know, I'm talking about applying this rank size rule to pastoralists in the Southern Urals, to Mesopotamia, you know, 3000 BC, this whole idea of applying our mentality to the past, do you, you know, are you for it? Are you against it? May there be some issues with that? Do you agree with this kind of approach? Uh, and this, again, is just an opinion, not a right or wrong answer. What are you guys' thoughts on this? Tatiana, maybe you can say something about this. Uh, about applying our knowledge of society on the previous time? Yeah, about applying you know, our models, like rank size, you know, let's forget about rank size, but just in general, you know, let's say we have a bunch of, we know a bunch about how our society behaves. And can we apply these models to the past or not? Mm. Yeah, I think we do. And one of the, one of the, authors of the articles discussed it. One of the earliest ones that if we don't know enough about the culture, we can speculate. And it depends like, about what are we talking about? Uh, the organization of some uh, health maintaining systems or or something that, which is more related to the external condition. I think we can apply now. Okay. <clears throat> what do others think? Maria, maybe you can say something about this. Mm, it's hard to say <laughs> uh, okay. if we can apply or not, but probably now we know more about any recent um, you know, so we know more about our recent societies and about uh, what happened in the, our territory not far along so I don't know is it helpful or not really <laughs> I have a different answer Okay, and let me, let me rephrase this a little bit. Um, do you think that these people in the past were same as us? Like they're thinking, give me just one second, please. No, of course they were different and the way of thinking wasn't different. Okay. No, I mean, uh, the people who were before us, of course, their way of thinking, their way of thinking was different, for sure, as an economic approach, as a um, particular life. So all of the things, their activities were different. Um, all of these things were different. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is kind of what I was driving at, you know, what is your opinion, you know, uh, for example, it, it comes up often when we're talking about economics, like economical models of, uh, for example, maximizing profits, you know, can I apply this principle of maximizing profits to 4,000 years ago, where people thinking like that, or are these models inapplicable to some, you know, hunter gatherers, for example, or some bronze age pastoralists, you know, in the Eurasian steppes? Um, what do you guys think about that? Let's 
so Ma Maria thinks, you know, they were kind of uh, quite different, right? Uh, or do you think that they were the same? And in what ways you think they were the same and in what ways they were different? You know, are there are certain types of models that we can apply or cannot. So they were the same in um, their need, in their needs, like as we are, so what to eat, where to live, and so on. But I think they have no, they have no needs, for example, how to earn, uh, maybe not money, how to earn any resources to uh, improve their way of living. So, okay, we have so a, the bigger branch of uh, needs, and not of not all of them are, uh, I would say, like biological needs. Okay, so I've heard you say that you know when it comes to, for example, them like eating, you know, for example, maximizing their calories, we can model that quite safely right we can say that you know all people want to survive that's sort of an instinct so i can model okay in these conditions given these options will this person go what choices this person will make you know will they go for resource a or resource b or maybe you know in the winter to maximize the calorie intake they will hunt and in the summer they will fish you know I'm assuming that they're rational. I'm assuming that they want to survive and they want to consume the most calories. Um, but basically, you know, it's a more fundamental issue in archaeology because there are some people who say that we cannot apply <clears throat> our modern models um, to the past. But then there are some people, I would say most archaeologists, who say that we can apply our models to the past. So for example, you know, this principle of, okay, if there was trade going on in Mesopotamia, I'm assuming that the traders, people who exchanged, you know, uh, metal for grain, they want to maximize their profits, just like people do today. I'm assuming that. And with that assumption, I will go and test my data and build some models. There are some, you know, are there people who say that this assumption is false and I cannot assume because these people in Mesopotamia were so different from us, you know, that they did not, they were not interested in maximizing their profit. You know, it's up to you guys to sort of decide, but, um, or, or another example is, you know, for example, if I want to model a road, an ancient road, an ancient path, from point A to point B, I will assume that people want to get from point A to point B by spending the least amount of calories or the least effort, which is the same thing really. I'm assuming that, I may be wrong, right? That a person will, it will not go uphill or will not climb like a rocky mountain, they will go around that mountain to get to something that's beyond the mountain. I'm, I'm going to assume that. Am I right? Am I wrong? I don't know. You know, it's sort of a matter of opinion. But if you take away that assumption, that will pretty much discredit 90% of archaeology. Okay? Because that's what we do in archaeology. We assume that, you know, we know some fundamental principles of thinking of these people, um, without it, it's very difficult to analyze these people. Because if you say, look, these people were so different from us, their brain was completely different. You know, they, they like to climb the mountains, you know, for no reason. Or they like to, not to get profit, they like to lose money during trade. I can't do anything with that. I can't model the behavior of these people, I'm sorry. You know, I can't do it. So this is what, you know, and it's good that this issue came up. You guys, uh, you know, understand more about archaeology and why we build and apply these models in this whole process. You know, why are we using rank size graphs when we're talking about the middle Uruk period? That's why, you know, I mean, there is some, uh, there is some room for these types of assumptions, basically.